This is the Master Brewers Podcast, brought to you by the Master Brewers Association of the Americas, a volunteer organization dedicated to continually improving the products and processes of our membership since 1887. Let's go! 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 Master Brewers brings you interviews with the industry's best and brightest in brewing science, technology, and operations. Calm down, we're moving too fast. This Master Brewers podcast is proudly sponsored by Hopsteiner, a global leader in the hop industry focused on quality, sustainability, and innovation in new hop varieties and hop products. Contact our brewery sales team to provide you with the hop-related tools you need to craft your next great beer. For more information, visit hopsteiner.com. Additional support provided by... Get to know Proximity Malt. We malt superior, European-style, low-protein varieties grown close to home in Delaware and Colorado. Domestically grown, precisely malted to style. With our team of seasoned experts and two brand-new malt houses, try what's really new in malt. Check us out at www.proximitymalt.com. I think there's some basic blocking and tackling that most brewers need to have in, in their wheelhouse that they can um, address those quality issues quickly and uh, troubleshoot them and, and uh, really put their arms around them. It, there's always going to be a challenge to your quality system when you're innovating. I think that's, that's the bottom line, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't stop. You just need to be prepared for it. This week on the show, author of Quality Management, Essential Planning for Breweries, and founder of Top Note Tonic, Mary Pelletieri, is here to discuss today's challenges in beer quality. I think a lot of us were drawn to this industry by the allure of innovation. Tell us about your relationship with innovation. Well, I too was drawn to the industry uh, for the innovation that... um, was going to happen. You know, it was back, I guess, in the um, early 2000s when I really got going at Goose Island. And we were just then looking at barrel aging and and looking at um, playing with different types of organisms that you can use in beer and make different flavors from them. And I think that that's an exciting prospect to bring new flavor and a new experience to the market that maybe hasn't been seen for a long time or hasn't been seen ever. And uh, that's, you know, exciting your customers is why, why people get into business. Um, so I think that's always going to be there, that, that innovation and that drive to innovate and excite your customers is there. The challenge is it, you have to be ready for it on the quality side. So I had the fun of playing both roles, the role of uh, drive some innovation, but also drive the, drive the quality that's got to keep the, keep the arms around the rest of the brewery and make sure nothing else gets impacted by the innovation. So that, that I think uh, those two things are always going to be kind of head to head in battle. Um, but if you're really smart about it, you bring your quality team um, together with your innovation team they're kind of one in the same and that's how we did it at goose and we had a lot of fun doing this but then we all all it it seems like we were kind of like a two brain system we'd have people pushing the challenging the quality system and then the others on the other side saying but how do we control that um i think the the best story i had was when we um developed matilda which was a Britannomyces beer. And it was one of the few in the States, I think might have been the only one in the United States in which we were doing pure yeast cultures. So we're using a pure um, Belgian style yeast and then a pure Britannomyces strain uh, as a secondary. And no one really knew how to make a beer like that, at least here. I'm sure there's other brewers across the globe that know how to do that, but we were, you know, new to it. So we had to challenge ourselves as to how to do a a dual fermentation beer and then also how to control the fermentations um, once they get started. And actually how to control the Britannomyces and propagate Britannomyces. Um, So it was every step of the way, we were challenging our standard system. But then also every step of the way, I think we got better at understanding our standard system. So, you know, sanitation is a perfect example. How do we sanitize? Should we sanitize differently when we're done with this beer? Should we follow this beer um, differently when we're 
when we're bottling it, should we run it last? Should we, um, you know, there's all sorts of things in terms of even hoses and the condition of the hoses. Um, we, we challenged ourselves in a good way. I think the beer made you look at everything that you were doing in a way that was um, a kind of a positive reinforcement of good practices you have and maybe some practices that you were missing. Most brewers will eventually have an experience that brings home the importance of innovating safely. Do you want to talk about any disastrous innovations or close calls that you've experienced over the years? <laughs> um, I think most brewers have uh, even the accidental disaster or, or a close call. I, I can s- certainly speak for others that have um, I've I've talked to that have run into issues. Um, I had left Goose Island prior to some uh, quality issues that had came about um, after they really you know expanded on barrel aging. But I, I would say barrel aging is probably. Um, the one area in which most brewers have had some learning experiences, um, just because the organisms that are involved in barrel aging are ones that aren't typically seen or um, you're introducing kind of a new microflora to the brewery in which your standard ways of measuring and and uh, dosing your sanitizer or even following through with sanitation, um, you know, completely breaking down equipment, that sort of thing, get, they get challenged. So I would say barrel aging is probably the, especially the wild bears has, has been the most, um, most challenging for breweries. I certainly know of one brewery that, um, you know, after bottling a, a delicious tasting barrel aged beer, uh, wild beer, um, started seeing explosions of bottles in their, uh, in their warehouse. And that of course drove them to, not ship the product and then realize they have to flash pasteurize those beers before they bottle them. Um, you know, that's, that's a good example of there's many uh, unknown variables that can really hit you. And it was a, it was a good thing that they didn't ship it. You know, they had it still in, in storage and um, I, I'm certainly certain that was unintentional, but that, that was a good, uh, a good thing to happen considering how bad the circumstances would have been if it got into the field. Talk about some of the risks that come along with innovation. So some of the risks that I come along with innovation really go into the foundation of uh, your quality program. That, that being, are you checking for stability? Are you checking for consistency? Are you checking for the flavor that you that you that you're desiring? Is that what's in your beer? Um, th- those are some of the the standard risks that you have to check physical stability, no matter what is one of those areas in which brewers, as well as any sort of beverage makers, always looking to ensure uh, that you have a a stable product from if you're looking for a consistent haze or an inconsistent haze, if you're looking for consistent flavor and that you're also not looking for the the product to really change uh, dramatically in the bottle not only from a visual standpoint, but from um, any sort of microbiological or flavor standpoint. So gushing is a good example of lack of stability. I knew a brewer that added um, quite a bit of spice to their to a beer. It was a very successful beer, um, and it was using kind of a well-known spice brand. And they, the sales team loved it. It sold like gangbusters you know it really was a different um introduction and it was a great like seasonal introduction and but yet at the same time they were having gushing complaints like crazy and they couldn't quite figure out what the root cause you know could have been they it was a filtered beer but you know that was a good example of spices um there's a lot of variables and spices that you can be adding to your beer that could potentially cause some lack of stability from a physical standpoint. A gushing is a good example. It's just, you know, there's, those are, that's something that the brewery could not resolve without just not adding the spice. So um, that's a, that's a good example of stability that people forget about gushing, but also refermentation. That's obviously a big issue. Um, You're, you're not technically allowed to put anything in your bottle or can that could potentially re-ferment because that's actually adding a risk to the market. So um, following through with that is, you know, a good practice would be to 
take something new that you've innovated with that potentially could re-ferment, um, even if you don't know for sure, might be something, a, a new organism that you've introduced to the to the brewery. And just like the brewery I spoke with earlier, you know, they held that product somewhat accidentally, but holding a product for a little bit of time after you bottle it for the first time or even challenging it could be a good chance to for you to find a re-fermentation issue that you would not otherwise find in the market. Yeah, it's something um, people don't think a lot about when there's pressure to get that new product out there but that's important. It is important. I think planning accordingly. Um, it, I know this for, for my own, um, you know, current innovations that you do have to plan for uh, testing and, and doing some shelf stability testing when you f- get new products in the market. It, it, those few weeks of you testing something new uh, pays dividends, especially if you do it much earlier on in the process when you're able to adjust the process before you get to a large batch. So I think it just comes down to planning accordingly. It, and innovation is not something that should happen in three months. It should happen over a period of, of you know, 12 to 18 months. Uh, it takes that long of a time to really plan it accordingly, uh, plan for everything that could possibly fail, test those failures, and then, uh, you know, finalize your, your batches. Yeah, if you've got a Gantt chart or whatever for your development process, add that phase in there for sure. I, I remember being part of a new products development team and we were constantly missing our, our deadlines and we finally got it all into a Gantt chart and realized, oh, this process is actually a lot longer than we've allocated time for. So that's that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah and and you know, I think you have to know a release date um, and work backwards from that. And and know that you've, you've just got to give yourself a, an abundance of time. If people are right now working on their seasonals for next year, um, you know, that's this being winter, beginning of December, they should be working on their seasonals for next year, this time of year. They should be thinking about them and, and starting those, those processes. And, you know, sometimes that's difficult to do because you might be already working on something that you want to release in the summer <laughs> yeah. and you're, and you're more excited about that project cause it's coming up sooner. Um, it, it is, a, it is a challenge to do multiple of these projects. So that's also, I think it's good to have multiple teams on these things. If you can, if the, your brewery can afford to have, you know, smaller teams in which, um, people are focused on a specific project versus having multiple projects going on. That actually helps quite a bit because that focus is actually um, where you deeply think about something versus kind of, Oh, uh, you know, maybe jump through stages that you shouldn't jump through so quickly. It's good advice. One of the things I love about Master Brewers is that the organization is now coming up on its 132nd birthday, and the archives go back very far into that history. So often issues come up that modern day brewers assume are new problems that they're going to have to solve for the first time. But a quick search at MBAA.com might reveal that there was extensive research 40 years ago on whatever it is you're dealing with today. Yeah, that that's absolutely true. Um, that's always been the case in the beer industry. We seem to rediscover uh, what we what we forgot. Um, certainly, in the case of of microbiology, I think there's been a lot of pressures on the standard, you know, pure um, yeast fermentation that we've we've put put on breweries these last uh, 45, 50 years. Um, even just introducing ales into the system uh, again, as as heavily as we did with the craft beer renaissance, that that alone was a, a lot of new learning because ales hadn't been studied <laughs> for a very long time. Um, and, you know, I remember being at Goose Island thinking, why can't I find any research on ales? It seems like um, they've, they've forgotten about it because most breweries were, you know, lager breweries, and that's where that's where the study was. Um, but that being said, uh, we have introduced such a variety of different yeasts as well as bacteria back into the breweries that we forget there's um, synergies that these organisms create within the brewery. There's certainly stages in which there's more risk um, in which these these organisms can outgrow and therefore you need to be very keen and aware of them. Um, I had a brewery just the other day call me up and say, we, we're seeing this organism. We don't know what it is. It turns out I looked at it and I said, it's bacillus. 
you know, and they, they had no clue where bacillus came from. And I had to remind them, look, it's an early stage. You know, it, it, it absolutely can be considered um, a non-beer spoiler, but it's certainly an indicator of something that could potentially, um, you know, show, show up and, and show future beer spoilage organisms have potential there. Um, they they um, were pretty concerned about it, so they ended up holding and, and testing that beer further. But, you know, that's, um, that, and that was because they were, pushing a process they were pushing um a process in which they were um putting hops in earlier and holding at a temperature that might not have been um hot enough you know they're trying to extract as much hop uh, profile as they could which i understand brewers you know are constantly going to push the process but knowing what organisms you potentially could be um allowing to grow because of it is helpful and that that's kind of going back into the old annals and looking up, you know, these old papers and saying, okay, I need to start looking for these organisms, ones that I've never heard of, and I don't even know what they look like, but I got to go figure this out um, because I'm, I might be pushing the system. Another area besides temperature and time that people forget is pH and another brewery, another brewer actually brought that up to me when I was doing this talk at um at the mbaa in milwaukee they said you know ph is another area of control that we have over our beer keeping the ph low and and that that's a perfect example of some uh, a place where a brewer might um decide to let the ph drift up a little higher um and you know for whatever reason i'm not i'm not suggesting this is happening now but that's an area of control that breweries have to realize that's controlling a whole outgrowth of, of other types of organisms and if you let that get too out of hand you're going to have other issues on your on your hands so um just kind of knowing why we do what we do you know time temperature and and control of ph and alcohol these are things that have controlled for a long time um, different organisms that otherwise will find their way <laughs> yeah I, I think we might have talked about this on another episode but now that we know dry hopping significantly increases beer ph and in some cases with very high dry hopping rates brewers need to pay attention to whether or not their beer ph meets the fda's definition of acid food and, and there seems to be some concern about what might happen if the FDA or TTB discovers some beers out there that aren't necessarily meeting that definition. Yeah, alcohol certainly is a nice um, a nice thing to have in beer, and it helps prevent some 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 further issues. But absolutely, I remember being at Siebel and the older microbiologist saying at the time, "Look, we've not discovered if we can actually grow, um, you know, food pathogens in beer. Um, we've certainly haven't seen it yet." But, you know, there are potentially conditions in which brewers might challenge the system um, and we might find that we can. And that would be, you know, that's not going to be a good day for the for the beer industry if it happens. But no. I would say, you know, those controls of pH and alcohol are really critical and ones that um, all brewers have to be completely aware of. You've said in the past that the list of beer spoilers hasn't changed much over the years, but the pressures on the system have. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, I found an old list of beer spoilers that um, really has it's just kind of been the, the standard list of beer spoilers for ages from any, anywhere from what can happen, you know, from mashing and wort to fermentation to when you're dispensing. Um, those contaminants that can, you know, put pressure on a system happen because we, um, as we've discussed, the system has been challenged one way or another. Um, there's uh, there's some good challenges that we're putting out there. For example, I like to I always like to point out Pectinatus megasphera, both organisms that, generally speaking, breweries in the U.S. haven't had such challenges with. You know, it was, it's always been more of a, an issue seemingly in Europe. Um, as well as Japan. But when you think about what they're doing in those circumstances, they have a very, very, very um, highly controlled environment um, where they're also uh, controlling the, the oxygen um, to a very tight standard. And I think that is happening now in um, even smaller craft breweries. And these organisms tend to love very low oxygen environments. Um, so it, it comes, you know, 
great. We've we've lowered the uh, the oxygen and are making you know maybe more shelf stable beer, but we're also maybe opening up ourselves to other organisms that might. Um, find their way one way or another and you need to be starting to look for these things you know those are we i never played it for pectinatus and megasphera when i was at goose island um i suspect there's some breweries now with some very low 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 do and low low um, oxygen fillers out there that should start (laughs) um (laughs) because you know they're they're really um potentially opening themselves up to to a risk that they didn't know they had um that's just it's just kind of comes with the territory. Let's dig into uh, some of those organisms a little bit more. And and you, you just mentioned pectinatus uh, and megasphera. Talk a little bit more about how brewers can, can, can defend themselves from those organisms. Um, Well, I think pectinatus megasphera, you know, I've not been challenged, thank goodness, with, with actually, um, seeking these organisms out in a brewery. My understanding is they can be pretty difficult to find. Um, but there's medias, there's specific medias out there. Um, the SMMP media, the MRS with fructose. Um, there's some medias out there that you can use to, um, at least test for them. I think in terms of preventative, uh, maintenance, it comes down to specifically that in, in your, um, fillers, and in the environment of the filler, keeping it um, exceptionally clean and doing, you know, complete breakdowns. I, I go into um, a bit of a, the biofilm synergy scenario where pectinatus um, may really thrive is actually in an area in which a biofilm gets formed. And then there's also additionally very low O2 um, where that uh, surface has been compromised one way or another with um, um, dirt as well as uh, you know kind of a, a a smattering of yeast and maybe some lactic acid bacteria just from the environment um, and before you know it you've got really kind of this perfect um, opportunity for pectinatus to outgrow um, specifically because it's it's chewing down those other organisms and and the residual nutrients that they left and it's it's benefiting from having a very low o2 environment so I think with pectinatus, it comes down to making sure that you're really cleaning the heck out of your equipment and and searching for those areas where biofilms can form. Um, and if you're following um, the the original equipment manufacturer's um, directions in terms of maintenance and, and complete breakdowns for sanitation, you're probably doing the right thing. But many people don't find themselves having the time to do that, and they're um, running so frequently that they don't do that frequently enough. So I think it comes down to, you know, you're in a low O2 environment. You do need to challenge yourself to make sure your sanitation still stays top, top notch because you are potentially, you know, can have potential other organisms that decide, Hey, I like this low O2 environment. They're going to cause some really bad flavors. No one, no one wants eggy slash, um, <laughs> eggy veggie, uh, uh, potentially sour beer that doesn't taste good. <laughs> no, it does not. Coming up. When you challenge a new, new um, a brewery with a new product, you're challenging your quality system. Therefore, you may have to change up that testing regime. You may have to add more tests. I'm John Bryce, and you're listening to the Master Brewers Podcast from the Master Brewers Association of the Americas. This Master Brewers Podcast is proudly sponsored by Barna Mechanical, a full-service design build firm specializing in turnkey process and utility systems for the brewing industry. We partner with some of the best craft brewers in the U.S. to ensure the great beer they brew is what their customers get in every glass, bottle, can, or keg. You know beer. We know breweries. Additional support provided by... ABS Commercial is a full-service brewery and parts outfitter. From our Raleigh headquarters to our Denver office, we proudly offer brew houses and fermenters from three barrels and up, yeast brinks, boilers, kegs, chillers, tri-clamp, and other stainless parts, all with the quickest delivery and lead times in the industry. Learn more at abs-commercial.com or call 877-BREW-ABS. ABS Commercial. We are brewers. 
Here's what's coming up on the Master Brewers calendar. The District Eastern Canada Christmas Party is December 19th in Montreal. Looking ahead into the new year, District St. Louis meets at Anheuser-Busch January 17th. Is PCR right for your brewery QC program? Check out the Master Brewers webinar January 24th. The District Ontario Annual Conference is January 31st and February 1st. District St. Louis meets February 21st at Third Wheel Brewing. And the 2019 California Joint Technical Conference is February 28th and March 1st in Paso Robles. It's not too early to start making plans for the 2019 Master Brewers Conference. If you can only make it to one conference in 2019, this should be it. We're really mixing it up this time and heading to the Calgary Convention Center to see how Alberta celebrates Halloween. Will there be a costume party? Only Tressa knows. Check out the full calendar of events at mbaa.com for more details or to find a district meeting near you. Now back to the show. Let's talk about uh, lactic acid bacteria in a little more detail. Obviously, one of the the things that's changed in terms of different pressures on the system now is that uh, in many cases, lactic acid bacteria is actually an ingredient. Tell us more about that and and sort of, you know, what brewers should be doing, um, how they can detect it and uh, how they should be defending themselves. Well, you know, um, the lactic acid bacteria, uh, that group of bacteria probably have the most in terms of microbiological detection, um, we've got probably the most medias that can potentially detect those um, bacteria pretty pretty swiftly. I think I still like Shoes Lactobacillus pediococcus media for that reason. It's a very simple media to make in the brewery. You don't need a autoclave, and uh, you just need some sterile pipettes and sterile test tubes, and you can test for lactic acid and pediococcus bacteria kind of throughout your process. So testing for it isn't really that difficult. I think um, the challenge with um, more pediococcus and lactobacillus is pediococcus tends to, to hide in places where it's very hard to find it. Um, there's a famous example of a very large brewery having a recall for pediococcus, um, and they found it in the CO2 a dispense system kind of they were, they were recovering their co2 but that's where it actually was found so it tends to hide again in places where it's got the perfect atmosphere these organisms tend to like more of a both co2 and o2 atmosphere so it might not be perfectly low 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 oxygen but they um but they tend to thrive in those areas especially where there's residual beer that could be found so um these are organisms that we have a lot of tools to detect them with what we don't necessarily have are you know we're not necessarily swabbing every possible place where they could potentially be showing up but it comes back to very um basic blocking and tackling and maintenance as well as a combination of maintenance and sanitation are really the keys the in, in my my book that i wrote for the ba um several years back now that I, I mentioned how maintenance and sanitation needs to be a um, combination effort. And in smaller breweries, you can do that. You know, in the larger breweries, I saw that to be a challenge um, because they were really completely different uh, unions, literally. But the um, maintenance and sanitation world, um, I, I always thought the folks that are responsible for maintenance should also have sanitation under their belt because they need to, you usually need to break down equipment completely in order to fully sanitize it. Lactic acid bacteria is in general just a, a you know a small component of the native flora that's in breweries. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's that's been well known in the brewing industry. Most brewers realize that you've got spent grain, you got lactic acid, but the um, the the over under is just you've got to make sure that you're always looking for it in places that you may not consider you need to. Um, such as the CO2 lines, for example, or making sure that anything that you're connecting to tanks, um, any any connection points. I've even heard of brewery, you know, using a um, CO2 testing, um, kind of handheld testing uh, monitor that they were actually not fully cleaning that out when they went to go to um, their next tank and test. And they realized they were just kind of 
dosing each tank that they tested, potentially with whatever was happened to be, you know, resident in that chamber. And they uh, had to had to kind of really reconsider how they were using that equipment. So anything that you t- that you t- t- attach to your tank, you know, how did you clean that? Um, when was the last time it was cleaned? Those sorts of questions come up because lactic acid is around, lactic acid bacteria is around, and it's, it's potentially going to uh, give you problems over the long term if you're not um, routinely thinking about those things. Yep. I guarantee you I've worked in breweries that inoculated tanks with CO2 testers. <laughs> um, yeah. It's a common problem. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. How about, uh, do you want to talk about uh, phenolic off flavor? Sure. So, um, you know, more recent issue in the beer industry that, again, I've um, only from a consultant standpoint have been um, asked to weigh in on has been the phenolic off flavor yeasts, um, the Saison style yeasts that have um, kind of implemented them or or in, infected some some breweries with some uh, you know, major recalls. Um, I was actually consulting for a brewery at a time where we certainly detected um, a, a phenolic off flavor, actually in an IPA, and uh, thought at the time that it might be something that was just us being too, you know, critical. It turns out it was something that um, definitely got worse over time, um, and most likely was a, a yeast that was over- outgrowing within the fermenter you know thank goodness we had a a keen um cellarman that was tasting before he was filtering and we held that tank for a few days before deciding on our our future action with it um but you know usually when you when you have an inkling that something's wrong like in a flavor it most likely is not going to get better um i i have multiple um examples of where breweries have blended out flavors sometimes to their detriment um so you know you you're better off taking an off flavor that and not making it worse by making a lot more beer with it because that was actually you know that's one of corrective action sometimes you think you could blend it out it's just a a small minor defect you can blend it out with a lot of beer put it at five percent well if you throw five percent of an infected beer into a lot of other beer, you're making quite a bit of bad beer. <laughs> the only thing worse than 50, 50 barrels of bad beer is five thousand barrels of bad beer, right? That's right. <laughs> you did the math for me. Thank you. It 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 happens quickly. Um, there there's uh, so the, that's an obviously a tried and true method of of breweries is to blend out um, defect and it. it you know, generally speaking, um, depending on what you're doing and you know what you're doing, it can work, but there's, there's opportunities in which you're, you're trying to save, you know, a small quantity of beer and end up, um, making a a large recall. So there's, I think it's just being aware of that. And that's, that's besides, so that was an example of not blending out a phenolic off flavor. It turns out that root cause, um, we discovered was, the yeast we were receiving um, had, um, you know, a, a small quantity of a, um, we didn't type it, but we knew it grew on copper sulfate. And we knew that that didn't belong in that yeast culture. Um, so some of the breweries that have kind of grown into knowing how to monitor and test for this problem the phenolic off flavor yeast issue is not necessarily something that's gone away in the beer industry i'm certain that it's being um tested a lot more and monitored more frequently for now um but there's some basic things that even if you don't have pcr you don't have some really fancy tools you can do and i always say look for the um look for the potential problem where you're most likely to find it it's very difficult to find a small quantity of of off flavor yeast in a large tank of beer you know it can produce probably a lot more flavor than than it's than you're able to actually detect um you can detect with your 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 palate, but it's hard for you to find it, say, using traditional microbiological methods. Um, but if you test the yeast coming in, that's a better opportunity to find a much higher sampling of, you know, potential off flavor or a, a contaminant in, in your in your system. So I always like to say if, 
you got to look for um, if you got to look for a needle in a haystack, look in a much smaller, <laughs> look at a concentrated haystack. <laughs> find find where you have that concentration of potential where you can find it a, a lot better. And my recommendation of breweries is always don't bother looking for wild yeast um, in your tanks of beer. It's going to be really, really difficult to find and difficult to have enough of your an, enough sampling in, in which you can find that needle in a haystack. Look for it where you're most likely to find it, and that's in those in in any sort of slurry of yeast, um, especially at propagation phase. Good advice. Uh, do you want to talk about coliform bacteria at all? Um, coliforms. Well, coliforms are certainly um, something that can make flavor and make off flavor and um you know obviously are known in the food industry as potential um uh, spoilage but also foodborne um pathogens so you need to be aware that coliforms as a group um are are something that can easily be tested for they are something that in which your water you need to be looking for them in your, in your water uh sources all the time i like to challenge breweries to make sure that they're you know after after carbon filtering carbon filters are actually coliform concentrators <laughs> we'd like to call them um because you're filtering out all sorts of 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 they just trap a bunch of organics and nasties, it's like a field day yes yeah. but it becomes a it becomes a field day for bacteria and coliforms are in water um again coliforms being a, a large group of microorganisms that may or may not be pathogenic um there's quite a few that are not so you you can look for these and test for these as good indicator organisms of sanitation and that's always been my advice to breweries is if you find these gram negative organisms kind of early phase or in fermenters or even prior to fermentation starting that's a good indication that there might have been some sanitation issues in which residual water um, was left somewhere uh, that was you know had stayed for a while and the coliforms will, will grow pretty quickly in any circumstances in which there's just some some a, a trace amount of food and some water um, they are in your um, you know despite filtering with a carbon filter you're not cleaning that you could potentially be concentrating coliforms and you're not necessarily cleaning that that water from coliforms you're potentially adding coliforms to your water so um, carbon filtration is one of those areas in which breweries have to be very clearly aware of how to clean and sanitize their carbon filter i was in a very large brewery when which we were challenged with that um and spending a lot of resources and time and energy literally energy to clean those carbon filters until we um realized some sanitation further downstream was really um the best route to go yeah and most craft brewers don't have a stainless steel housing for those you know they've got the the cheap plastic resin tanks too that you can't steam clean or anything like that so i guess uv is a, a good option uh on the outlet of a Yep. carbon uh, activated carbon filter if you if you need some extra protection against that sort of bacteria right that's exactly what um this brewery ended up doing so yeah that that that's the way to go if you can do that if you can afford to do that it's absolutely the way to go otherwise you have to you know consistently maintain your your um filtration set with probably more water and energy than you want to spend yeah Okay. I, I think both you and Master Brewers are good at meeting brewers wherever they are in their journey. So let's talk about understanding the limits of a quality system, no matter how small or young the brewery is. What questions do brewers need to be asking themselves? Well, I think the questions brewers need to be asking themselves is, um, you're young and growing, and you know that you know that you need to be testing your beer. I think there's a lot of headache and and uh and, and questions that brewers kind of throw at themselves is are am i testing enough um i th i think most brewers know kind of the standard sensory tools that they have are a very strong quality tool and never forget that like i said this small brewery that i was working with we discovered phenolic off flavor just by tasting you know there was nothing more fancy than that and just holding so using your sensory throughout the entire process is the best tool you have and the cheapest one you have um i think the other um uh i think further into that slide um knowing 
your sanitation issues and potentially where you are not fully CIPing. If you are, if you have a really, really, really good sanitation program, you don't need to test as much. And and breweries figure that out as they go along um, because they have the control upstream. And the foundation of quality is the more control you have of the process inputs, the less testing you need of the process outputs, right? So I I control my brewery by, you know, having a very strict regimen of sanitation in which we're testing um, every step of the way from time, temperature, and concentration, maybe even ATP swabbing. Um, and we know that we um, aren't challenging our system further downstream, and therefore our micro-testing can be minimal. Um, if you're not doing that with your sanitation pro- program, your micro testing is probably going to have to be a lot more um, in- intensive. And I remind brewers of that, that y- your control is not the test at the output. Your control is the t- is everything you're doing <laughs> um, to build in control of the process at the input and, and testing all those inputs as much as you possibly can. So, um, The foundations of quality are there. The foundations of how you control a system um, are well documented and well written about at this point in time. I think a lot of brewers need to know that when you challenge a new new um, a brewery with a new product, you're challenging your quality system. Therefore, you may have to change up that testing regime. You may have to add more tests. to the table, new tests to the table, uh, more frequency to the table for short term, just to make sure those controls are controlling for the potential risks. So it, it, I always look at innovation as a way to really um, know know the limits of your quality system, challenge your quality system, understand your quality system even more deeply, and um, test out um, potentially those limits. I have a a good example of doing this actually in a very large brewery um, that we, um, we were doing a new product and it had um, several flavor over ads, one being a cloud. And some brewers probably are like, Oh my goodness, how could you add a cloud to a beer? Well, there are breweries across the world that are adding cloud to beer. Turns out that this, this particular flavor over ad um, from the supplier wasn't well controlled. And uh, we, sim- not really um, fully understanding or seeing those certificates of analysis, I asked my microbiologist to simply test more frequently <laughs> these, this new beer. Um, and they were not happy with me. <laughs> they said, we have to test more. Yes, just test more frequently. I know we normally do, you know, an N equal one on these tanks. Let's do an N equal 10 and do that three times before we release the tank. And it turns out we found some micro issues that we would not have otherwise found just doing our standard procedure. Um, the brewmaster at the time um, really thought it was a waste of all their time and, and energy and effort. But he thanked my, kissed my feet at the end of that project because he said, you know, I would have followed my standard procedures and my standard testing, and I would have not caught that until I, I really buried a lot more beer, um, you know, in the ground. It just would have been a, a big problem and a big cost. So a small additional testing in terms of new innovation, change the frequency of some testing, change up what you're doing, make sure everything's being, you know, contained and controlled, saved us a lot of money. And that was a, a good example of, of, of how to kind of do innovation right with a quality system in conjunction. What are some of the most basic things you recommend all brewers find a way to master? I think finding a way to master, um, Sensory first, your sensory system, and and just challenging yourself to know how to uh, taste and smell the beer process throughout the entire process. That's the first most simple thing you can do. And then also really trust your sensory data. Um, As you're you're getting bigger and growing, you're going to be... Um, under pressure to release beer more frequent, more fast, you know, it's just simply going to happen. And you, you may be challenged to say, uh, that beer didn't quite taste like what I thought it should, but I'm going to release it. There's many, many, many stories in the beer, beer trade in which um, the sensory program 
potentially caught something early on, but they let it go and it became a big problem later on. Um, a good example that would be a phenolic off flavor. If you think you taste it, you do taste it. You're to hold that beer and, and to, and to um, monitor it and or make a disposition to dump the tank. Um, the sensory panel at the very end of the f- uh, of at the end of everything, prior to going to bottling, is the most important quality check you have, and it's one in which you have to challenge that sensory panel. So uh, a a good a good check on your panel is to put um, you know slightly off flavored beer on that panel. Make sure that they say it's a no go. Um, that's a, a a great QA test on a QC test, right? So. Um, Sensory is was the first thing to master, Ch- trusting sensory and, and having a way to QA it, and then also having some special panels and being able to do quick duo, tri- duo trios, triangulars, types of panels in which you are um, you know quickly assessing if a problem truly is a problem and making a disposition off of data versus... Um, you know, debate. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's gotta be a procedure, not just a bunch of people sitting around talking about it. Right. Um, and then the other side of the coin is microbiology and having some real foundational microbiology knowledge. As we've talked here, there's just some basics that people all have to know. Go back to those old MBAA, um, technical quarterlies. There's some really good data in there. Um, the ASBC additionally has a really good information from when these tests were originally developed. Have a good background in that and just the basics of microbiology. I think there's some um, new tests out there like PCR that I do believe um, you know could challenge the, the that our kind of foundational understanding. Um, but remember, we have controls even in the beer industry in which these tests have to be vetted um, prior for, for them to be really, you know, fully accepted as, as, a, as a true test in the industry. So just understand the basics of your sensory and microbiology program, how they can work together, um, and trust the data. Learn to have good tests on your tests and trust that data and, and actually react to it. <laughs> That was Mary Pelletieri here on the Master Brewers Podcast. Check the show notes for a link to today's challenges in beer quality, which Mary recently presented to District Milwaukee, as well as a link to her book, Quality Management, Essential Planning for Breweries, which can also be found at mbaa.com slash store. Hey, remember the Belgian beer book that Sten Mertens and Jan Stensels talked about on episode 101, The Yeasts of Tomorrow? Well, great news. It's now available in the Master Brewers bookstore. Just go to mbaa.com slash store and type Belgian beer into the search bar to get your copy today. And then I hit on the ground Just like that one day when we came around there